Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 298, Andrews Norton on John 1. Andrews Norton was arguably the most influential American Unitarian Christian scholar in the first half of the 19th century. He was born in 1786 and died in 1853. Educated at Harvard University, he went on to serve as their chief librarian and as a professor of theology. He was a first-rate scholar. He translated the four Gospels. He wrote three heavy volumes defending the historical reliability of the Gospels. And he correctly diagnosed the fashionable, transcendental philosophy, which was a large part of the downfall of American Unitarianism in his time as, in his words, the latest form of infidelity. The book that you're going to hear a chapter from today resulted from an earlier controversy between the famous American Unitarian minister William Ellery Channing and an evangelical Trinitarian scholar named Moses Stewart, who was a professor at Andover Theological Seminary. Channing published a sermon that was kind of a brief for Unitarian Christianity, and Stewart replied to it at length. Norton then composed a journal article replying to the biblical arguments in favor of the Trinity as put forward by Moses Stewart. And later on, he enlarged that article to three times the size, resulting in a substantial book. And unfortunately, he kept the same clunky title of the article, which was A Statement of Reasons for Not Believing the Doctrines of Trinitarians Concerning the Nature of God and the Person of Christ. Despite the clunky title, this is a very valuable book, and I recommend owning it. After all these years, it's still a very worthy read and has a lot of specific things to contribute to the discussion. In the latter portion of the book, Andrews Norton classifies the different types of passages which Trinitarians appeal to to try to derive a Trinity doctrine from the Bible. And some of them, you know, have to do with misunderstanding, he would say. Some of them have to do with mistranslation. The introduction to John's gospel, he puts in its own classification. It's a group of one. And I think it's fair to say that this passage is very unique in the New Testament. I think Andrews Norton can teach us a few things about this famous passage. So without further ado, here's Norton's discussion of the famous introduction to John's gospel. We will now attend to a passage that has been misunderstood through ignorance or disregard of the opinions and modes of conception which the writer, St. John, had in mind. This is the introduction, or proem as it has been called, of his gospel. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. There is no word in English answering to the Greek word Logos, as here used, It was employed to denote a mode of conception concerning the deity familiar at the time when St. John wrote, and intimately blended with the philosophy of his age, but long since obsolete and so foreign from our habits of thinking that it is not easy for us to conform our minds to its apprehension. The Greek word logos, in one of its primary senses, answered nearly to our word reason. It denoted that faculty by which the mind disposes its ideas in their proper relations to each other, the disposing power, if I may so speak, of the mind. In reference to this primary sense, it was applied to the deity, but in a wider significance. The Logos of God was regarded not in its strictest sense as merely the reason of God, but under certain aspects as the wisdom, the mind, the intellect of God. To this, the creation of all things was especially ascribed. The conception may seem obvious in itself, but the cause why the creation was primarily referred to the logos or intellect of God, rather than to his goodness or his omnipotence, is to be found in the Platonic philosophy as it existed about the time of Christ, and particularly as taught by the eminent Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria. According to this philosophy, There existed an archetypal world of ideas formed by God, 
the perfect model of the sensible universe, corresponding, so far as what is divine may be compared with what is human, to the plan of a building or city which an architect forms in his own mind before commencing its erection. The faculty by which God disposed and arranged the world of ideas was his logos, reason, or intellect. This world, according to one representation, was supposed to have its seat in the logos or mind of God. According to another, it was identified with the logos. The Platonic philosophy further taught that the ideas of God were not merely the archetypes, but in scholastic language, the essential forms of all created things. In this philosophy, matter in its primary state, primitive matter, if I may so speak, was regarded merely as the substratum of attributes, being in itself devoid of all. Attributes, it was conceived, were impressed upon it by the ideas of God, which Philo often speaks of under the figure of seals. These ideas, indeed, constituted those attributes, becoming connected with primitive matter in an incomprehensible manner, and thus giving form and being to all things sensible. But the seat of these ideas, these formative principles, being the logos or intellect of God, or, according to the other representation mentioned, these ideas constituting the logos, the logos was, in consequence, represented as the great agent in creation. This doctrine being settled, the meaning of the term gradually extended itself by a natural process and came at last to comprehend all the attributes of God manifested in the creation and government of the universe. These attributes, abstractly from God himself, were made an object of thought under the name of the Logos. The Logos thus conceived of was necessarily personified or spoken of figuratively as a person. In our own language, in describing its agency, agency in its nature personal and to be ultimately referred to God, we might indeed avoid attaching a personal character to the Logos considered abstractly from God by the use of the neuter pronoun it. Thus, we might say, all things were made by it. But the Greek language afforded no such resource, the relative pronoun in concord with Logos being necessarily masculine. Thus, the Logos or intellect of God came to be, figuratively or literally, conceived of as an intermediate being between God and his creatures, the great agent in the creation and government of the universe. Obsolete as this mode of conception has now become, there is a foundation for it in the nature of the being contemplated and of the human mind. The deity, conceived of as existing within himself, removed from all distinct apprehension of created intelligences, dwelling alone in his unapproachable and unimaginable infinity of perfections, presents a different object to the mind from the deity operating around us and within us and manifesting himself, as it were, even to our senses. It is not strange, therefore, that these two conceptions of him have been regarded apart and more or less separated from each other. The notion of the Logos, it is true, is obsolete, but we find something analogous to it in the use of the term nature in modern times. Employed as this often is, the mind seems to rest in some indistinct notion of an agency inferior to the supreme, or an agency, to say the least, which is not referred directly to God. The conception and the name of the Logos were familiar at the time when St. John wrote. They occur in the apocryphal book of the Wisdom of Solomon. The writer, speaking of the destruction of the firstborn of the Egyptians, says, chapter 18, verse 15, Your almighty Logos leaped down from heaven, from his royal throne, a fierce warrior into the midst of a land of destruction. In another passage, likewise, in the prayer ascribed to Solomon, he is represented as thus addressing God. Chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. God of our fathers and Lord of mercy, who has made all things by your logos and fashioned man by your wisdom. The terms the logos of God and the wisdom of God are here used as nearly equivalent in signification. A certain distinction was sometimes made between them, but they were often considered as the same. In the book just quoted, we find strong personifications of wisdom in chapters 7, 8, and 10. 
considered as an attribute of God, and described in such language as was afterwards applied to the Logos. In the Proverbs, there are similar personifications of wisdom, such as in chapters 1, 3, and 8, which the Christian fathers commonly understood of the Logos. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Norton discusses a parallel to this sort of language in purely Jewish, unhellenized writings. The use of the word logos in the sense that has been assigned to it was derived from the Platonic philosophy, but we find among the Jews a similar mode of conceiving and speaking of the operations of God unconnected with this philosophy and appearing in the use of a different term, the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit. By either expression, in its primary theological sense, was intended those attributes or that power of God which operated among men to produce effects that were believed to be conformable to his will as manifested in the laws of his moral government. Thus, the miracles of a teacher from God, the direct influences of God upon the minds of men, and all causes tending to advance men in excellence, moral and intellectual, were referred to the Holy Spirit. The idea of its invisible operation was associated with it. To express what has been said in different terms, it denoted the unseen power of God acting upon the minds of men in the direct or indirect production of moral goodness or intellectual ability in the communication of truth and in the conferring of supernatural powers. The conception is of the same class with that of the Logos, and the Holy Spirit is in some instances strongly personified as by our Savior in his last discourse with his apostles. The divine power which was manifested in Christ might be ascribed indifferently to the Spirit or to the Logos of God, as the reader or hearer was more conversant with the one term or the other. St. John, writing in Asia Minor, where many for whom he intended his gospel were familiar with the conception of the Logos, has, probably for this reason, adopted the term Logos in the introduction of his gospel to express that manifestation of God by Christ, which is elsewhere referred to the Spirit of God. It may be observed that, amid the confusion and inconsistency of those conceptions of the earlier fathers which afterwards settled into the doctrine of the Trinity, we often find the Holy Spirit and the Logos spoken of as the same power of God. Thus, Justin Martyr, in reference to the miraculous conception of Christ, says, in his first Apology, chapter 33, we must not understand by the Spirit and the power from God anything different than the Logos, who is the firstborn of God. Theophilus of Antioch says, to Autolycus, book 2, chapter 10, that the Logos is the Spirit of God and his wisdom, though he elsewhere, chapters 15 and 18, makes a trinity of God, his Logos, and his wisdom. The wisdom of God was commonly conceived of as the Logos of God, but Irenaeus, like Theophilus, gives the former name to the Holy Spirit. Book 4, chapter 20. Tertullian says, against Praxius, chapter 26, The Spirit of God, the Spirit spoken of in the account of the miraculous conception, is the same as the Logos. For as, when John says the Logos was made flesh, we, by the Logos, understand the Spirit, so here we perceive the Logos to be intended under the name of the Spirit. For as the Spirit is the substance of the Logos, so the Logos is the operation of the Spirit, and the two are one thing. What? When John said that the Logos was made flesh, and the angel that the Spirit was to be made flesh, did they mean anything different? End quote. See also chapter 14 and his book against Marcion, book 5, chapter 8, and also Irenaeus against heresy, book 5, chapter 1, section 2. But to return, 
The conception that has been described, having been formed of the Logos, and the Logos being, as I have said, necessarily personified or spoken of figuratively as a person, it soon followed by a natural consequence that the Logos was by many hypostatized or conceived of as a proper person. It will be convenient in what follows to use the term personify and hypostasize with their correlatives as distinguished from each other according to the senses assigned them in the text. When the corrective of experience and actual knowledge cannot be applied, what is strongly imagined is very likely to be regarded as having a real existence, and the philosophy of the ancients was composed in great part of such imaginations. The Logos, it is to be recollected, was that power by which God disposed in order the ideas of the archetypal world. But in particular reference to the creation of the material universe, the Logos came in time to be conceived of by many as hypostasized, as a proper person going forth, as it were, from God, in order to execute the plan prepared, to dispose and arrange all things conformably to it, and to give sensible forms to primitive matter by impressing it with the ideas of the archetypal world. In many cases in which the term Logos occurs, if we understand by it the disposing power of God, in a sense conformable to the notions explained, we may have a clearer idea of its meaning than if we render it by the term reason or wisdom or any other which our language offers. In the writings of Philo, who was contemporary with our Savior, we find the Logos clearly and frequently hypostasized. According to him, considered as a person, the Logos is a god. In a passage which has been closely imitated by Origen, he says, Let us inquire if there are really two gods. He answers, The true God is one, but there are many who, in a less strict use of language, are called gods. The true God, he says, is denoted by that name with the article, the the. Others have it without the article. And thus his most venerable Logos is called God without the article. No one, he says, can comprehend the nature of God. It is well if we can comprehend his name, that is, the Logos, his interpreter, for he may be considered, perhaps, as the God of us imperfect beings, but the Most High as the God of the wise and perfect. He represents the Logos as the instrument, the organon of God in the creation of the universe, as the image of God by whom the universe was fashioned as used by him like a helm in directing the course of all things, as he who himself sits at the helm and orders all things, and as his firstborn son, his vice-regent in the government of the world. Those, says Philo, who have true knowledge, knowledge of God, are rightly called sons of God. Let him, then, who is not yet worthy to be called a son of God, strive to fashion himself to the resemblance of God's firstborn Logos, the most ancient angel, being, as it were, an archangel with many titles. A little after, he calls the Logos the eternal image of God, and elsewhere applies to him the epithet eternal. He represents the Logos as a mediator between God and his creatures. To the archangel, the most ancient Logos, God freely granted the high distinction of standing between and separating the creation from its creator. With the immortal being, he intercedes for what is mortal and perishing. He announces the will of the Father to his subjects, being neither unoriginated like God nor originated like man, but standing between two extremes, he is a hostage to both, being a pledge to the Creator that the whole race of men shall never fall away and revolt, preferring disorder to order, and giving assurance to the creature that the God of mercy will never neglect what he has made. Such conceptions are expressed by Philo concerning the Logos as a person. If his representations of him, so far as they have been quoted, are not perfectly consistent, they do not imply that he wavered much in the view of his character, and these representations were received by the early fathers as the groundwork of their doctrine concerning the personal Logos. But upon further examination, the opinions of Philo will appear more unsettled and unsteady, and new conceptions will present themselves. We will discuss these hereafter. It is only necessary here to observe that, in his opinions relating to this subject, there was little fixedness or consistency.
the images which floated before his mind changed their forms. Throughout his writings, he often speaks of the personal agency of the deity in language as simple as that of the Old Testament. In a large portion of the passages in which he makes mention of the Logos, it may be doubted whether he conceived of it for the time otherwise than as an attribute or attributes of God. On the other hand, it is also to be observed that the influence of his Platonism, when it was ascendant in his mind, did not terminate in hypostasizing the Logos alone among the powers or attributes of God. When the Trinity's podcast returns, is the word or Logos of John 1 a person or a personification? From the explanations which have been given of the conceptions concerning the Logos of God, it will appear that this term properly denoted an attribute or attributes of God, and that upon the notion of an attribute or attributes, the idea of personality was superimposed. Now, let us consider the probable meaning of the first words of St. John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God and the Logos was God. These words admit, I think, only of two explanations. Either St. John was using the word Logos simply to denote the conception of those attributes of God which are manifested in the creation and government of the universe, and in the last clause intended to declare that in the contemplation of them no other being but God is to be contemplated, and that all their operations are to be referred directly to Him, or he meant to speak of those attributes as hypostasized and to represent the Logos of God as a proper person, such as he is described by Philo, the minister and vice-regent of God, who, always acting by the power and conformably to the will of God, might rhetorically be called God, according to the figure by which we transfer to an agent the name of his principal. It is contended indeed that his words admit of a different meaning, that the Logos is here spoken of as a proper person, but that this person is at the same time declared to be literally God. But if we so understand St. John, his words will express a contradiction in terms. The Logos, he says, was with God, which, if the Logos be a person, necessarily implies that he is a different person from God. Whoever is with any being must be diverse from that being with whom he is. As far then as we may be assured that St. John did not affirm an absurdity in terms, so far we may be assured that he did not affirm that the Logos, being a person with God, was also literally God. Of the evangelist we may say here, as Tertullian says concerning another passage quoted from him, he is to be explained conformably to all rather than in opposition to all that he is elsewhere written, and in opposition, too, to the sense of the words themselves. Here, therefore, we dismiss the Trinitarian exposition and proceed to consider how the passage is to be understood. We have now only to choose between the two explanations first given. St. John has personified, or he has hypostasized the Logos. Has he spoken of the Logos simply as of the attributes, or, as we may say, the power of God manifested in his works? Or has he adopted the philosophy of some of his contemporaries and intended to represent this power as a person? Whether St. John did or did not adopt this Platonic conception is a question not important to be settled in order to determine our own judgment concerning its truth. But that he did not is rendered probable by his not alluding to it elsewhere in his Gospel and by his never in any other place introducing an intermediate agent between God and his creation, or referring the divine power manifested in Christ to any other being but God himself. <laughs> 
it is unlikely that he would receive a doctrine of this kind which had not been taught by his master, and neither he nor any other of the evangelists has recorded that this doctrine was taught by Christ. The nature of the doctrine itself, which presents the strange conception of an hypostasized attribute or attributes, would alone forbid the supposition of its having such an origin. It is clearly traced to a different source, to a philosophy which, considering St. John's intellectual habits and his manner of life, was not likely to have a strong influence over his mind. But setting aside these considerations, the passage itself affords, perhaps, sufficient reason for believing that the evangelist did not intend to speak of an hypostasized logos. The logos, he says, was God, that is, the supreme being. If we conceive of the logos as a person, the agent of God, those words considered in themselves admit, as I have said, of a figurative sense. But they would express an assertion which is made by no other writer who entertained this conception of the Logos. Philo, or the earlier Christian fathers, would equally have shrunk from asserting the Logos to be God, as the word God is used by us. The earlier fathers understood the term God, as here used by St. John, in an inferior sense, regarding it as denoting what we might express in English by saying that the Logos was a divine being. But this unquestionably is not its true sense. St. John, just having used the word theos, God, to denote the supreme being, would not in the next clause thus vary its signification. And corresponding likewise to what I have before observed, his general use of this term, like that of the other apostles and evangelists, was the same with our own use of the name God. Assuming then that the word theos, God, in the passage before us, denotes the deity, what purpose or inducement could St. John have had to assert, in a figurative sense, that the logos was the deity, upon the supposition that he believed the logos to be a distinct person, the agent of the deity? I think none can be conjectured. Thus far, I have been arguing merely against the supposition that St. John adopted the Platonic conception of an hypostasized Logos, but as to the further supposition that he believed his master, Jesus Christ, to have been not a man, properly speaking, but that Logos clothed in flesh, it is here sufficient, after all has been said, to remark its inconsistency with the whole character of his narrative and those of the other evangelists, and with every other part of the New Testament. Had St. John believed his master to be an incarnation of a great being, to whom the name Logos might be applied, superior to all other beings except God, we could, with our present view of the character of the Apostle, assign no other ground for this belief than an assurance of the fact resting upon miraculous evidence. Had he then held this belief, he would everywhere have spoken of his master conformably to it. Christ would have appeared throughout his gospel and the other gospels not as a man, which he was not, but as the incarnate Logos, which he was. No reason can be assigned why he should not have been usually denominated by that name. His real character kept constantly in view, and all his words, actions, and sufferings correctly represented as those of the agent intermediate between God and his universe. When the Trinity's podcast returns, does John say that the Logos is an intermediary between God and the cosmos? Or is it just God? And Norton gives his translation slash paraphrase of this whole passage. Let us now examine whether the language of the Apostle can be better explained if we understand him as using the term Logos merely to denote the attributes of God manifested in his works. It was his purpose in the introduction of his Gospel to declare that Christianity had the same divine origin as the universe itself, 
that it was to be considered as proceeding from the same power of God, writing in Asia Minor, for readers, by many of whom the term Logos was more familiarly used than any other to express the attributes of God viewed in relation to his creatures, he adopted this term to convey his meaning because, from their associations with it, it was fitted particularly to impress and affect their minds, thus connecting the great truth which he taught with their former modes of thinking and speaking. But upon the idea primarily expressed by this term, a new conception, the conception of the proper personality of those attributes, has been superimposed. This doctrine, then, the doctrine of an hypostasized logos, it appears to have been his purpose to set aside. He would guard himself, I think, against being understood to countenance it. The logos, he teaches, was not the agent of God, but God himself. Using the term merely to denote the attributes of God as manifested in his works, he teaches that the operations of the Logos are the operations of God, that all conceived under that name is to be referred immediately to God, that in speaking of the Logos we speak of God. Thus he says that the Logos is God. The Platonic conception of a personal Logos distinct from God was the embryo form of the Christian trinity. If, therefore, the view just given of the purpose of St. John be correct, it is a remarkable fact that his language has been alleged as a main support of that very doctrine, the rudiments of which it was intended to oppose. Considering how prevalent was the conception of the Logos as a distinct being from God, it is difficult to suppose that St. John did not have it in mind. But it is to be observed that the preceding explanation of his words is independent of this supposition, and that they are to be understood in the same manner, whether they are supposed to refer to that conception or not. It is, then, of the attributes of God as displayed in the creation and government of the world that St. John speaks under the name of the Logos. To this name we have none equivalent in English, for we have not the conception which it was intended to express. In rendering the first eighteen verses of St. John's Gospel, I shall adopt the term power of God. It is, perhaps, as nearly equivalent as any that we can conveniently use, but in order to enter into the meaning of the passage, we must associate with this term not the meaning alone which the English words might suggest according to their common use, but the whole notion of the Logos as present to the mind of the Apostle. Adopting this term, we may say that the power of God, personified, is the subject of the introductory verses of his Gospel. It is first said to be God, and afterwards declared to have become a man. It is first regarded in its relation to God, in whom it resides, and afterwards in its relation to Jesus, through whom it was manifested. Viewed in the former relation, what may be said of the power of God is true of God. The terms become identical in their purport. Viewed in the latter relation, whatever is true of the power of God is true of Christ, considered as the minister of God. His words were the words of God. His miracles were performed by the power of God. In the use of such figurative language, the leading term seldom preserves throughout the same determinate significance. Its meaning varies, assuming a new aspect according to the relations in which it is presented. Thus, an attribute may be spoken of as personified, then simply as an attribute, and then again as identified with the subject in which it resides, or the agent through whom it is manifested. In regard to the personification of the Logos by St. John, which is a principal source of embarrassment to a modern reader, it was, as I have said, inseparable from the terms in which the conception was expressed, the actions ascribed to the Logos being of a personal character, and the use of the neuter pronoun being precluded by the syntax of the Greek language. St. John then says, In the beginning was the power of God, and the power of God was with God, and the power of God was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him nothing was made which was made. In Him was the source of blessedness, and the source of blessedness was the light for men. And the light is shining in darkness, though the darkness was not penetrated by it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. This man came as a witness to bear testimony concerning the light, that all might believe through him. 
He was not the light, but he came to bear testimony concerning the light. The true light, which shines on every man, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and by him the world was made, and the world acknowledged him not. He came to his peculiar possession, and his peculiar people received him not. But to many as received him, he gave a title to be children of God, to those who had faith in him, they being born not of any peculiar race, nor through the will of the flesh, nor through the will of man, but being children of God. And the power of God became a man, and dwelt among us, full of favor and truth, and we beheld his glory, such as an only son receives from a father. John bore testimony concerning him, and proclaimed, This is he of whom I said, He who was to come after me has gone before me, for he was my superior. Of his inexhaustible store we have all received, even favor upon favor. For the law was given by Moses, the favor and the truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has ever seen God, the only Son who is on the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. And let me pause here to present a couple of his footnotes where he explains a couple of his interesting translation choices. First, where he says, In him was the source of blessedness. Norton comments, Zoe, rendered in the common version, life. It is here, however, used in the sense of blessedness as often in the New Testament. But the blessedness spoken of is that which is communicated, not that which is enjoyed by the Logos. I did not perceive, therefore, that the sense of the original can be expressed more concisely in English than by the words which I have used. This blessedness is communicated through the revelation of religious truth, the intellectual light, not of men, but for men. In other words, the revelation made by the power of God through Christ, which is the light of the moral world, is the source of blessedness to men. And when it mentions the true light, Norton gives this footnote, the true light, that is, the power of God, the Logos, so called because he is the source of the light, the revealer of religious truth. So the true light that's coming into the world, Norton understands to be the Logos, not properly speaking the man. The part where it says, they be born not of any peculiar race, it says ukex haimaton, literally, not of particular races, haima being here used in the sense of race, as in Acts 27.26, and by secular authors. Blood in English is used in a similar sense, as in the expression, they were not of the same blood. The meaning of the whole 13th verse is, that the blessings of the gospel were not confined to any particular race as that of the Jews, and that none received them on the grounds of natural descent as children of Abraham and the other patriarchs. And on verse 14, traditionally the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He comments, Sarx agenito, rendered in the common version, became flesh. The sarx, in its primitive meaning, flesh, is often used to denote man. When it is said that the Logos, or the power of God, became a man, the meaning is that the power of God was manifested in and exercised through a man. It is afterward, by a figurative use of language, identified with Christ, in whom it is conceived of as residing. When the Trinity's podcast returns, what about John's statement that the Word became flesh? And also... Does the beginning of John's first letter shed any light on this prologue of the gospel? So Norton continues his discussion. 
To one familiar with the uses of figurative language, the interpretation may appear obvious. Some Trinitarians, however, may object to it as forced. I would therefore ask him who believes that by the Logos is meant the second person of the Trinity to consider the exposition which he himself puts upon the words. According to this, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, who is himself God, became a man, or to adopt the rendering in the common version, was made flesh. God became a man, or was made flesh. By the word rendered became, or was made, the Trinitarian understands to be meant that he was hypostatically united to a man, was so united to a man as to constitute with him but one person. It is a sense of the Greek word agenito, not to be found elsewhere. To say nothing of the meaning of the whole sentence, if it may be called a meaning, which results from giving agenito this unauthorized signification. The anti-Trinitarian, on the other hand, understands the word as equivalent to became, in that figurative sense in which we may say that one thing is or becomes another when it manifests its properties in that other thing so spoken of. He perceives as little difficulty in the language as in that with which Thompson concludes his Hymn on the Seasons. He writes, These, as they change, Almighty Father, these are but the varied God. As the seasons are figuratively called God, because God in them displays his attributes, so the Logos is figuratively called a man, because in Christ were manifested the same divine power, wisdom, and goodness by which the universe was created. It is by no means uncommon to find in the same passage an attribute or a quality now viewed in the abstract and personified and then presented to the imagination as embodied in an individual or individuals. Thus Thompson, on the same page in the volume before me from which I made the last quotation, says, Heaven-born truth wore the red marks of superstition's scourge. It is truth, considered in the abstract, which is described as heaven-born or revealed from heaven. It is those who held the truth who were scourged, by superstition. Other similar examples might be adduced. I will give one expressly conformed in its general character to the passage under consideration, in which no person accustomed to the use of figurative language will suppose that its proper limits are transgressed. Goodness is seated on the throne of God and directs his omnipotence. It is the blessedness of all holy and happy beings to contemplate her, the supreme beauty, and become more and more conformed to her image. It is by her that the universe is attuned and filled with harmony. She descended from heaven, and in the person of Christ displayed her loveliness, and called men to obey her laws, and enter her kingdom of light and joy. But she addressed those whom their vices and bigotry had made blind and deaf. She was rejected, despised, hated, persecuted, crucified. It may appear from what has been said that the figure by which St. John speaks of the Logos as becoming a man, or, in other words, of Christ as being the Logos, belongs to a class in common use. But it might have been sufficient at once to observe that analogous modes of expression are used even by Philo, though he regarded the Logos as a proper person. Considering the Logos as the agent of God in the creation and government of all, the being through whom God is manifested, Philo applies that name to other beings, the agents of God's will. In this use of the term, it may be seen that the Logos being viewed as the primal, universal manifestation of God, all particular manifestations are referred to it by Philo as parts to a whole, or the one Logos is supposed to act in every particular Logos using all as its ministers. However this may be, he familiarly calls the angels logoi, in the plural, and applies the term also to men. Thus, he speaks of Moses as the law-giving logos, as the divine logos, and when he interceded for the Israelites as the supplicating logos of God. Aaron is called the sacred logos. The same title is given to Phineas upon occasion of his staying the plague in the Jewish camp.
Such language being common, the contemporaries of St. John would readily understand him when he speaks of the Logos becoming a man, or of Christ as being the Logos. When afterwards the Christian fathers regarding the Logos as hypostasized, supposed it to have become incarnate in Christ, they, of course, put a new sense upon the words of the Apostle. So that's basically the end of Norton's discussion of the introduction to John's Gospel. There's a little bit more that I'll present to you, though, and here he disagrees with interpreters who think that there's a strong parallel between this introduction to the Gospel according to John and the beginning of the first letter of John. He writes, I may here take notice of a supposed analogy, which I believe does not exist, between the introductory verses of St. John's Gospel and those with which he commences his first epistle. In the latter, by the expression rendered in the common version, word of life, logos te soes, he intends, I think, merely the Christian doctrine as the life-giving doctrine, and has no reference to the philosophical notion of the logos of God. This expression and others similar are used elsewhere in the New Testament and in the same sense. See Philippians 2.16, Acts 5.20, John 6.63-68, 6, Romans 8.2, etc. The commencement of the epistle may be thus rendered. What took place from the beginning, then he has a footnote, that is, from the beginning of the Christian dispensation, the terms aparkes or exarchase, from the beginning, commonly occur in St. John's writings in reference to the beginning of a period determined only by the connection in which the words occur. Thus, in the second chapter of his epistle, verse 7, he says, Beloved, I write you no new commandment, but an old commandment, which you have had from the beginning, or rather, from the first. See also in this book 2.24 and 3.11, in the Gospel 6.64, 15.27, 14.4, 16.4, etc. Okay, back to his translation of the beginning of First John. What took place from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have beheld, and our hands have handled concerning the life-giving doctrine. For life has been revealed, and we saw and bear testimony and announced to you that eternal life which was with the Father, and that has been revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we announce to you, so that you may share with us whose lot is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Norton comments, Notwithstanding the coincidence of some words used in different senses, it is obvious that the purpose of St. John in the passage quoted was wholly different from that which appears in the introduction to his gospel. In the gospel, he intended to affirm that the Christian revelation was to be referred to that same divine wisdom, goodness, and power by which the world was created and is governed. In the first verses of his epistle, he merely affirms that what he had taught concerning this revelation rested upon his own personal knowledge, upon the testimony of his senses. And then he drops a note and says, There is a passage in the epistle to the Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, and another in the Apocalypse, chapter 19, verse 13, in which the conception of the Logos as an attribute or attributes of God appears to be introduced, as in the introduction to St. John's Gospel, but it would not be to our present purpose to remark upon them further. This week's thinking music has been the track Your Pulse by Little Glass Men. If you love the Trinity's podcast, please share this episode on social media like Twitter or Facebook and help other people to find the podcast by giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can also support the Trinity's podcast by giving a certain donation per episode. If you're interested in that, please visit patreon.com slash trinities. Finally, let us know what you think. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. The Trinities Podcast is supported by and made for thinking believers like you. Thanks for your support, prayers, and encouragement. For listening, we'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time. <laughs>
Don't forget to love God with all your mind.